So now, um, so what do you think about the, the the climate here in America? That you know, with the uh, uh, the, the people wanting to kidnap the uh, governor, the, uh, the, the 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 this new trend of uh, QAnon, and I say it's just a new version of the Tea Party. Seems like to me. Oh, absolutely, and it's going to get worse than that. Um, everybody is waiting to see how America reacts if President Trump is not reelected. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and. I am interested in seeing what's going to unfold as well. I think there may be some government manipulation in mm-hmm. the reaction mm-hmm. uh, when it does come. I have not yet determined whether or not I think they're going to reelect him or bring Joe Biden in. I do believe they want to keep Trump in for four more because they can make him the scapegoat for everything America does to harm other people. Hmm. But you have one man who becomes the scapegoat for the entire history of of mm. this country's racism and imperialism. Mm. Mm. So on one hand, keeping him there is good because he's willing to go to war. He benefits the wealthy. He's definitely a white supremacist, okay? And he doesn't mind being called the bad guy. He mm. relishes it. Mm-hmm. So from that perspective, I think he stays because you've never had a president who is insensitive to public opinion. Donald Trump is the first president I'm aware of, and although I've only lived under about six or seven of them, I've studied all... 45 of them, and he's the only one I know of who couldn't care less about public opinion. Okay, on the other hand, the media is giving him a lot of negative press. Mm-hmm. And usually when they give a candidate a lot of negative press, they're trying to sway public opinion the opposite direction. But here's the difference between Trump versus Biden as opposed to uh, Obama versus and I forget the per- versus McCain, mm-hmm. if you would. I knew that Obama was going to be president because he got nothing but positive press. But and, and McCain didn't get no press at all. Mm-hmm. It wasn't negative. It just was invisible. In this race, Trump is getting negative press, press, but Joe Biden is not necessarily getting positive press. And that's why I think even though they are taking a lot of jabs at Trump, I don't see them uplifting Biden the way they uplifted Obama. Mm. I knew Obama was going to be president. The press had nothing negative to say about Barack Obama, nothing at all. But I don't hear them doing the same thing with Joe Biden. They're crucifying Trump, but they're not lifting up Biden. And that's why right now I kind of feel like 50-50, but I'm still leaning to the fact that he may get a second term. Mm. I'm kind of feeling that. My my decision isn't isn't certain yet though. I'm I'm trying to uh, observe this, and it looks to me like this whole thing when uh, Trump started, he's just like uh, opened the doors to the underworld. I mean, it was it was already an operation, but it's like come, come on, y'all, this is our time, and we're going up and take it over. Absolutely, all Donald Trump did was make it safe to be publicly a racist again. You know, and he'll go down in history. I mean, white folks have never changed. I mean, they've been racist consistently Mm -hmm. and to the same level. But he made it comfortable to be racist publicly again. And we haven't had a president uh, make it comfortable for you to be racist in quite some time. You know, and that's why he's going to go down in history with a lot of white folks probably being his favorite president they Mm -hmm. ever had. Not because he did anything for them, but psychologically, the boost that he's given to the arrogance of racism has been historic. So now, if he doesn't win, do you think that America will begin to uh, uh, come down on the curve and, and become more I humanistic? So. I don't think so, because when I look at Barack Obama, mm-hmm. although he won, it actually emblazoned mm-hmm. the racism even more. Mm-hmm. I tell people all the time, the racism you see under Trump, was the momentum for it was mm-hmm. garnered under Obama. Mm-hmm. The momentum was eight years of Obama. Trump didn't create this wave. Mm-mm. He picked it up where Obama left off because Obama would not take up for black people. He encouraged racism. Mm. See, Trump is encouraging white people to be who they are, so he's encouraging it as well. But Barack Obama not doing anything to defend the integrity of black people is what gave this momentum. So Trump is really benefiting from the momentum that Obama Gardner, and most people would never put Donald Trump and Barack Obama in the same sentence. Mm. But if you look at the way Obama ended and the way Trump won, clearly there's a relationship there. And Donald Trump benefited 
from Barack Obama's ignoring of black America. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, when they get in that position, there ain't much they could do. You know, if it ain't in the interest of America, who, they're not going to last very long. If, they have, if they're not a team player, then they're going to get kicked off the team. Absolutely. If you're not a team player, you get kicked off the team. And that's why, Elder David, all of our young people who are going into politics, okay, I need them to really embrace the idea of being an independent candidate. Because when you run as a Democrat or a Republican, you're not independent. You are part of a team. You are part of a political machine. You are part of a white power structure who expects you to fall in line and take orders. Barack Obama had to take orders. Uh, Hillary Clinton had to take orders. The members of the Congressional Black Caucus, because they are Democrats, they're not independent. If the entire Congressional Black Caucus was independent, we would probably see more being done for black folks. But they are part of the Democratic team. So they can't just say this is best for black people. They have to weigh it against whether or not there's going to be white backlash for that position. Yeah, because I don't hear them saying anything. Exactly. And then they have to get permission. Mm. They have to get permission from the party bosses to actually endorse a program that may be for black people that white folks may have a problem with. How are you going to serve black people being concerned about why, how white people think? There is no liberation for black people that requires us to be concerned with how white people think. White people don't consider nothing black people think. Mm-mm. Your opinion is totally null and void with regard to anything they do. Why does their opinion weigh so heavily on us? That's why we have to become unapologetically African and independent. If you're not unapologetically African and independent, you're useless. And that same thing, Baba David, goes to national black leadership. I respect uh, Al Sharpton, but he has never been independent. He's always had relationships with white power structures. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Jesse Jackson. I respect him and some of the good things he's done, but he has never been truly independent. The fact that they operate nonprofits that receive donations and grants from white politicians and white corporations tells you right there they're not independent. Mm -hmm. You don't take that type of money from white interest groups and consider yourself to be independent. If you're not independent, you are invisible. Mm -hmm. And we need to teach that to our young people because many of them can't wait to run for office as a Democrat or Republican, which means it's going to do nothing to benefit black folks. You remember David Richardson here in Philadelphia? Were you you old enough to remember him? I I, I was a child. I was young. Uh, But I learned about him through his uncle, rest in peace, the late, great Dr. Calvin Robinson. Mm -hmm. I remember him, Mm -hmm. uh, who was up there with Elder Battle. So I learned about him because he would always tell me, you remind me of my nephew. Mm -hmm. He was charismatic and a good Mm -hmm. speaker. And he also told me that he believed that they uh, they murdered him, that he was assassinated, um, although it was treated like uh, food poisoning or something. He said it was a murder. They killed him. Wow. I, I never really understood the uh, definite, definitive uh, cause of death, but I certainly know that he was certainly missed because he was an independent voice here in Philadelphia uh, and, and was unapologetically black and didn't have no problems stating that. But um, uh, but uh, as, as uh, Calvin Robinson and uh, Redmond Battle said, uh, you remind me a lot about him. But actually, uh, to me, he's a lot more powerful because uh, even though David Richardson was powerful here in Philadelphia, you are powerful internationally. You go around the world speaking uh, truth to power where David Richardson was uh, mainly local. So, you know, I, I give you much more credit, than not, not, not to say that you're better, because actually you're not even a politician. Neither was he. He was a public servant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing, too, Brother David, I also think we need to start having uh, political teams that run. And what I mean by that is we need to have five candidates all running at the same time mm-hmm. for the major cities with the same agenda so they can support each other. Mm-hmm. In other words, imagine if you got a brother or sister running for mayor of Philly, running for mayor of L.A., running for mayor of New York, running for mayor of D.C., mm-hmm. and they're all on the same platform, mm-hmm. coming out as a team. Same thing with our state reps, same thing with our U.S. reps, mm-hmm. same thing with our council persons. We need to start nationalizing the black political struggle. But you know why we don't do that? Is because we're so tied into what the Democratic Party mm-hmm. has Negroes doing, and that's our problem. Yeah, I like. I would have liked to have seen like Stacey Abrams on the on a national party platform with other black uh, p- 
people running for high levels of office, and then it could be a, a it would be a national observance, and people would pick it up and say, "Hmm, I, I like what they're doing. You know, I could support that." Yeah, but I'm gonna tell you another reason why a lot of black politicians do not want to run on a grassroots ticket or a grassroots platform. Two reasons: number one is they don't want to be accountable to black people. Mm. Let's be honest. Most mm. of our politicians, mm-hmm. most of our preachers, they come from a very bourgeoisie mindset, especially the well-educated ones where they feel that they already know what's best for black people mm. and that they should be treated like celebrities as opposed to held held responsible as public servants. So a lot of them don't want to be accountable to black folks. That's mm. number one. Mm-hmm. And number two, okay, a lot of them are not interested in battling white people. They don't want to take on the white power structure for black people, which is why I always say nobody fears organized black people more than black politicians. Because the minute, imagine if black people in Philadelphia were organized, then all those blacks sitting down on city council and mm-hmm. were organized, mm-hmm. they would have to fight. They would have to fight mm-hmm. or they would lose their position. Mm-hmm. They don't want to do that. They've made relationships with those white folks downtown. Mm-hmm. The last thing they would have to do is go to the same white folks who they've been laughing with and having coffee and tea with saying, well, listen, you're going to have to change this, and you're going to have to change it. They don't want to do that. They're paranoid of doing that. And that's why they love to tell you to vote, but they never tell you to organize your vote. Mm Notice that. Mm -hmm. Black politicians love to tell black people to vote, but they never tell you to organize your vote. Because if you organize your vote, you will be able to hold them accountable, and they are not interested in being held accountable. Mm -hmm. 